Hi, I'm Dr. Wes Youngberg, lifestyle medicine specialist and assistant clinical professor at Loma Linda University Schools of Medicine and Public Health. I've spent the last 25 years helping people use natural strategies to reverse their health conditions. This is Diabetes Undone, where I'll show you how you can reverse diabetes and reclaim your health with simple lifestyle strategies. In this first episode of Diabetes Undone, my friend Brenda Davis, internationally acclaimed plant-based dietitian, and I explore the significant connection between diabetes and nutrition. Hippocrates was an ancient Greek physician who's considered to be the father of Western medicine. Even though he lived over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates was convinced of the power of nutrition to fight disease. He told his patients, let your food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. Healthy food is powerful medicine. And that's why I'm excited to introduce a special guest and friend, Brenda Davis. Brenda is a registered dietitian and a leader in the field of diabetes nutrition. She's the author of nine best-selling nutrition books, including Defeating Diabetes. Brenda and I first worked together on a diabetes research project in the Marshall Islands. I appreciate her perspective so much that I asked her to guide us through the nutrition module for Diabetes Undone. Brenda, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Wes. It's my pleasure. To start out, can you help us understand the connection between diabetes and nutrition? Oh, absolutely. Diabetes is usually characterized by the overconsumption of the wrong types of foods, as well as a lack of physical activity. If we look around the world, the lowest rates of diabetes occur in places where people live off the land, eat unprocessed food, and engage in moderate, constant physical activity. But when populations with these simple lifestyles become sedentary and adopt Western-style diets, which are rich in processed foods and animal products, their diabetes rates quickly escalate. For example, the Pima Indians in Arizona, the Micronesians on the island of Nauru, and the Marshallese in the Marshall Islands used to be essentially free of diabetes and obesity. But now an estimated 35 to 50 percent of their adult populations have type 2 diabetes. Asian countries used to have very low rates of diabetes, but now 60 percent of all type 2 diabetes cases are in Asia. Those are some sad statistics. It's shocking to see China and India becoming the global epicenters of diabetes. China used to have such low diabetes rates, but after rapid economic development and urbanization, many Chinese people have replaced their traditional diets with unhealthy food. It's clear to see that there's a connection between diet and the development of this disease. But the million dollar question becomes, can this be reversed. About 30 years ago, a unique study was conducted to find out. Researchers noticed that Aborigines in Australia who moved to urban areas developed very high rates of diabetes. They wanted to see if the opposite was true. So they did a survivor-like study where they took 10 obese diabetic Aborigines out of the city and into an isolated region of Australia. These 10 people returned to their traditional lifestyles, living off the land and gathering whatever food they could find. After seven weeks, participants lost an average of 18 pounds and dramatically lowered their blood sugars. A similar study was conducted in Hawaii. 19 obese islanders were placed on a traditional Hawaiian diet low in saturated fat and high in plant-based foods. In just three weeks, their weight dropped an average of 18 pounds and their fasting blood sugars dropped 43%. So we've talked about diabetes being reversed in several faraway countries. What about North America? Have similar studies been conducted here? Oh, you bet. And the results have been equally as impressive. In one study, 650 diabetics were placed on a high-fiber plant-based diet for just two weeks. 
They experienced major improvements in blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, and weight. But get this, 71% of the participants who were on oral diabetes medications were able to discontinue those drugs, and 39% of those on insulin were able to stop it completely. And this was in just two short weeks. It's amazing how quickly people can experience such dramatic results. Oh, it's true. And that's one of the really exciting things about working in this field. The body wants to heal itself, and it does so more quickly than most people would ever imagine. It really gets me excited. Another study was conducted in 2004 by my friend and colleague, Dr. Neil Barnard, to compare how two different diets impact diabetes. The study included about 100 type 2 diabetics. Half of them were assigned to follow the diet recommended by the American Diabetes Association. This diet emphasizes carbohydrate counting for blood sugar control. The other half of the group was assigned to follow a plant-based diet that was low in fat and sugar. They didn't have to count calories or carbs, but they avoided animal products and added oils. Both groups experienced improvements, but the plant-based group had much more dramatic results than those on the ADA diet. In fact, the plant-based diet was three times more effective at lowering blood sugars than the ADA diet. The plant-based group also lost twice as much weight, significantly lowered the risk for complications, lowered cholesterol, and experienced multiple other health benefits. Several of them eventually reversed the diabetes completely. The ADA group didn't need to adjust their medications at the end of the 12 weeks, but two-thirds of the people on the plant-based diet lowered their diabetes meds. And the people in the plant-based group didn't have to count calories or carbs? No, they didn't. In fact, the plant-based group ate significantly more carbohydrates than the ADA group but they were careful about the kinds of carbohydrates they ate. And that's something we'll discuss more in the upcoming videos. But first, we're in for a treat because we're going to hear the story firsthand from Nancy, a participant from the plant-based study. This experience completely changed her life, and 10 years later, she's still talking about it. I decided to participate in this particular diabetes study because I had, at that point, had diabetes for eight years, and I had been doing what I was supposed to be doing, and um, eating the American Diabetic Association diet, yet my numbers were creeping up, so the dosage for my medicine was creeping up. One of the fears I had that also drove me to participate in this study was I had two friends who had had diabetes type 2. and they were already on kidney dialysis and in the process of losing their eyesight and one had already had um, his leg below the knee amputated. And so when I was diagnosed with it, I had this horrible feeling that it was just a slow progressive death sentence. So I was willing to look at any alternative that was out there. What you do is eat fruits, whole fruits, vegetables, grains, and then legumes consisting of beans, peas, and lentils, and those are your protein. Um, I also eat very, very little processed food, um, whether it's vegan or not. I just pr prefer to eat fresh. Well, on medication, when I started the diet, my A1C number was 8.4. And at the start of the diet, about the middle of January of 2005, and by May, my numbers had dropped to 5.4, and I was also losing weight on this diet. So I needed to cut back the medications dramatically. Some of the other changes that I noticed, I had had um, pain in my joints. And as soon as I started eating vegan, the pain went away, and I didn't even realize it. It also, eating vegan also gives you know, it gives you a lot more energy. It gave me a lot more energy. I didn't have that afternoon slump after lunch that I'd always had. I also lost 48 pounds altogether just by changing to a vegan diet. So the, the effects were, to me, amazing, healthy, and rapid. 
I wanted one on the vegan diet. I um, had compared to the ADA diet where you weigh and measure and they have, um, you know, exchanges and that type of thing. If you eat just plainly on the vegan diet, you can eat what you want. You're not measuring, you're not weighing. I just found it a much simpler way to, to cook and eat. And there was, um, you know, after the study, of course, for me, the immediate results were incredible. And I thought to myself, well, there's no way I'm going back to the old way. Um, and I just found it's, a, it's a, change of, a change of life that was nothing but positive for me. So I maintain that all the time. And the study started about 10, 10 years ago. So I've been eating this way for 10 years. My last physical, my doctor said to me, I wish everybody's numbers were as perfect as yours. And I don't think that's bad because I'm 74 years old now. You know, I think about what my life would be like if I hadn't made those changes, going to a vegan diet. The two people that I referred to that were already having problems had, of course, since passed away. One had a heart attack during kidney dialysis. Um, I have... I've already laid out my calendar for 2015 for the trips that I'm taking, and I don't think I would be able to do that if I were had if my eyesight was going, if I'd had to go on kidney dialysis, if I'd lost a limb. Eating vegan gave me the hope I wanted to lead a healthy, full life, and um, you know my friends joke that they're going to have to you know, put a GPS on me to keep up with me. And so I have more energy now than I ever had. And the hope for me was absolutely rewarded by the vegan diet. I expect to live a lot more years and be busy all of those years. And that to me is the gift of eating vegan. I hope Nancy's story gives you hope. Perhaps like her, You've struggled for years to control your blood sugars and your weight. You may have tried different diets and failed, but don't give up. If good nutrition can work for Nancy, it can work for you too. In the upcoming videos, we'll show you how. We've already learned that a healthy diet goes a long way to prevent or even reverse diabetes. It worked for Nancy and it can work for you too. Healthy eating is actually pretty simple. Foods can be divided into three groups, green light, yellow light, and red light foods. If you want to transform your health, you need to eat green light foods. These foods are packed with powerful healing nutrients. Brenda, can you tell us more about green light foods? Absolutely. Green light foods are unprocessed or minimally processed whole plant foods. They are the richest sources of many protective nutrients that heal the body in more ways than we can count. When you have diabetes or prediabetes, your body is like a house on fire. What you put into your mouth can serve as gasoline or water. Green light foods are like water on the fire, fighting the flames and restoring balance. Green light foods are full of fiber, which is a plant superstar. Fiber is only found in plant foods, not in animal products. Fiber is the carbohydrate in plants that can't be digested or absorbed. Some people call it nature's broom because it keeps food moving through the gastrointestinal tract, helps keeping it clean and healthy. But fiber does more than preventing constipation. It also protects against obesity, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and a variety of gastrointestinal disorders. Even though your body can't absorb fiber, it desperately needs it. Fiber curbs insulin resistance and helps control blood sugars. The health benefits of fiber are greatest with intakes of at least 25 grams per day for women and 38 grams for men. Although the average American eats only 15 grams of fiber each day, people eating plant-based diets average closer to 40 to 60 grams per day. So how can you get more fiber? By eating green light foods. These foods include vegetables, 
legumes, and that's beans, peas, and lentils, fresh fruits, unrefined whole grains, and whole food fats. So let's take a closer look at each of these food groups, starting with vegetables. Vegetables provide the highest number of nutrients for the fewest number of calories. That means they're very nutrient dense. They're the richest sources of disease-fighting vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. Green leafy vegetables are at the very top of the list. In a study that surveyed over 200,000 people, it was found that eating at least a cup and a half of green leafy vegetables each day reduced diabetes risk by 14%. Try to eat a wide variety of non-starchy vegetables which are grown above the ground. They are low in calories and carbohydrates, but very high in nutrients. Starchy vegetables, such as potatoes and corn, are calorically dense, so portion control is important for people with high blood sugars. Try to get at least five or six servings of non-starchy vegetables each day. Include both raw and cooked vegetables because there are different advantages to each type. The next green light foods are legumes, which are beans, peas, and lentils. Legumes have been found to reduce risk of chronic disease, such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and premature death. In a study of over 60,000 women, those who ate the most legumes were 38% less likely to develop type 2 diabetes than those who hardly ate any legumes at all. Beans, peas, and lentils are high in fiber, they're high in protein, iron, zinc, and many other nutrients. They have a very low glycemic index, which means they're very gentle on blood sugars. A study published in the Archives of Internal Medicine found that people with type 2 diabetes who ate a cup of legumes each day experienced significant blood sugar improvements within just a few short months. You know, Brenda, many of my clients have found that eating beans not only improves their blood sugar for that meal afterwards, but it actually improves their blood sugar spiking after the next meal and the next meal and even the next meal. I'm not surprised. We actually even served beans for breakfast in the Marshall Islands, and we found our people loved them. You know, the Marshallese people eat mainly processed foods and animal products, so they average only about 5 to 10 grams of fiber a day. And as a result, most people have very infrequent bowel movements, sometimes once a week or even less. As you can imagine, when our participants started eating these really fiber-rich diets, their regularity improved a lot. And we actually had participants who were having a bowel movement once every week or two. And all of a sudden, they're having bowel movements every single day. And for some, it actually scared them. They thought there was something wrong with them. So it was a pleasant surprise for them to learn that this was absolutely normal. Some people find beans really hard to digest, especially when they first start eating them. It's best to add small amounts and gradually increase your intake. This allows time for your gut flora to adjust to all the additional fiber. If you don't have time to cook beans from scratch, canned beans and frozen beans are also nutritious, convenient alternatives. To reduce the sodium in these foods, choose low sodium or sodium free varieties. You can also rinse canned beans in a strainer to get rid of some of the extra salt. Many people are concerned that a plant-based diet doesn't have enough protein. Many fad diets include large amounts of protein, especially from meat. Brenda, how can we make sense of this protein question and how can we make sure we're getting the right amount? That's such an important topic, Wes. Protein is an essential nutrient, but the average American consumes more than is necessary. And people who follow high-protein diets, such as the Atkins diet or the Paleo diet, may actually be getting too much. There was a, a very recent 2014 study that found that people with the highest protein intakes have a five-fold increase in diabetes mortality. 
high protein intakes are also associated with an increase in cancer death and overall mortality. But what's really interesting is that these mortality associations only applied to animal protein. The disease risk disappeared if the protein was from plants. Excess protein, especially animal protein, is associated with a decline in kidney function. This can be especially harmful for people with diabetes who are already prone to decreased kidney function. Plant protein is less toxic than animal protein and much better for kidney function. And while animal protein raises cholesterol, plant protein actually lowers it. High protein intakes can also adversely affect bone health, especially when calcium intakes are insufficient. It's actually fairly easy to get enough protein from a plant-based diet. What we need is about 10 to 15 percent of calories from protein, and almost all plant foods fall within this range. 20 to 40 percent of calories in legumes and non-starchy vegetables come from protein. 8 to 17 percent of calories from grains, nuts, and seeds comes from protein. And the only foods that really consistently fall below the 10% mark are fruits and some non-starchy vegetables. So really, if you eat sufficient calories from a reasonable mix of whole plant foods, it's difficult to come up short on protein. Rich Roll is an ultra-distance athlete. He was named one of the 25 fittest men in the world. At the age of 40, Rich was a sedentary and overweight person, but after he adopted a plant-based diet, Rich lost 50 pounds and began his fitness journey. Rich isn't alone. There are many athletes who are fueled by plants. Carl Lewis, a former Olympic sprinter who won nine medals for the U.S., Dave Scott, who won six Ironman World Championships, and Martina Navratilova, one of the greatest tennis players of the 20th century. These athletes are living proof that animal protein is not necessary for strength or athletic performance. You can get plenty of protein from plants. You know, Brenda, I can think of another plant-based athlete you forgot to mention. Who's that? You. Oh, (laughs) well, I'm not a competitive athlete, but fitness really is part of my daily life. And at 55, I don't really feel a whole lot different than I did at 25. I can only hope that I can still do handstands and headstands when I'm 85. But let's get back on track with the green light foods. The next food group is fresh fruit. Fruit is full of vitamins, minerals, fiber, phytochemicals, all of which boost your immune system and improve your health in many ways. Fruit is nature's way of satisfying our sweet tooths. Some of the low-carb leaders warn people against fruit. I think this is a huge mistake. It's an important part of a healthy diet, but you do need to be aware that too much fruit can actually spike blood sugars, especially if you eat too many calories. We'll talk about how to avoid this in the upcoming meal balancing module. The next green light food group is unrefined whole grains, which we'll call green light grains. Many diabetics are scared of carbohydrates, but not all carbs are created equal. Green light grains carry many nutrients. Their high fiber content prevents them from spiking blood sugars as drastically as refined grains. Research shows that replacing refined grains with whole grains reduces diabetes risk. Unrefined whole grains are intact grains that have not been processed in any way. Examples include quinoa, brown, red, or black rice, wild rice, barley, rye, oat groats, millet, wheat, kamut, and spelt berries. Starchy vegetables like corn, potatoes, and winter squash, they actually fit better into the whole grain group than they do the vegetable group. They have more carbohydrates than non-starchy vegetables, but are still a very valuable part of a healthy diet. Colorful starchy vegetables such as yam, squash, and purple potatoes 
provide more phytochemicals and antioxidants than their paler counterparts. There are conflicting viewpoints about the amount of carbohydrate that diabetics should eat. Some people with diabetes strictly limit and count carbs. Other diets allow unlimited carbohydrate consumption as long as carbs are plant-based. I don't think either of these approaches is actually optimal for people with diabetes. I believe it's important to focus on both the type of starch you're eating and the amount. We'll discuss this more in the meal balancing section. The final green light group is whole food fats. Examples include nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, and whole coconut. These healthy fats are packaged with many protective nutrients and phytochemicals. Some diabetes diets advocate very low fat consumption and even discourage people from eating healthy fats. But there's a reason why nature provides whole food fats for us. These foods enhance the flavor of our meals and they leave us feeling more satisfied. They also maximize the absorption of fat-soluble nutrients, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. But high-fat foods are very calorically dense, meaning that they provide a lot of calories in a rather small volume of food. So we want to control portion sizes, which we'll discuss more in an upcoming video. Green light foods have an incredible healing potential for your blood sugars, your heart, and every aspect of your health. That's why I recommend getting 80 to 90% of your calories from green light foods. Why not choose these healing foods today? When it comes to driving and when it comes to eating, green means go. We've learned about how people are transforming their health and even reversing their diabetes by choosing better nutrition or green light foods. Between now and the next episode, make a trip to the grocery store and spend a little extra time in the green light section. Next time we catch up with you for another episode of Diabetes Undone, we'll learn more about yellow and red light foods. This four-part Diabetes Undone series focuses primarily on the nutritional aspects of diabetes reversal, but there's much more to know. If you would like to have access to the entire Diabetes Undone video course, visit DiabetesUndone.com where you can watch all 40 videos and we can continue to journey together as you reclaim your life and health.